we are we have some technical problem with some of the participants some of the, the speakers but uh, we would start by uh, introducing each uh, panelist each speakers um so welcome to the webinar Arca security webinar on, on security threats in Sahel and sub sahara regions um this seminar is part of the uh, Arca security webinar series and uh, um also it's part of the joint seminar series with igsda um, um Institute of Global Security and Defense Affairs, um, chaired by I, uh, Dr. Said Ghanim. And the, the entire series is titled, uh, oof, oh, no, no, sorry, <laughs> we are stuck. Yes. And wait, wait. Um, the entire um, series is, is entitled uh, uh, the uh, geopolitical dynamism in the wider Middle East region, and this round of seminar is titled uh, "Security Threats in Sahel and Sub-Sahara Regions." Um, but prior to moving on to the main topic of, of the, today's uh, topic, uh, Sub-Sahara and the Sahel region, um, Dr. Said Ghanem will introduce us to the recent situation in the Middle East and North Africa uh, with which Biden administration is faced. Uh, so uh, we have two parts now. Is a, there's short introductory part by, by uh, Dr. Uh, Said Ghanim and we will make short Q&A session right after uh, General Ghanim's presentation. It's about the situation in the Middle East and North Africa and what, uh, what the, the Biden administ administration's Middle East pol policy is faced with. So, so th then after his talk and qu uh, question um, answer session, we will go into the main topic of Sahel and Sub-Sahara regions and security threats. So uh, first, um, Dr. Said Honeim, as always, uh, we, we um, depend on you in, in summing up the situation, security situation in the Middle East and North Africa. So it, it's, it's your turn, please. Okay, let me share my yes. uh, screen first. Okay, just before I start, thank you so, so much. And I'm very happy to continue with our seminars. And maybe I would like everybody knows that I was ready with my presentation about Africa, but uh, Professor Satoshi would like also we agree together to give more opportunities uh, to more speakers. So in this time I will avoid my lecture about Africa and I will talk with my uh, uh, opening remarks, uh, something concerning uh, Biden. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will talk about what Biden administration, administration is faced uh, with in the Middle East region as like a reality check. This is what I will talk about. Actually, I made like something like questions, but before I start, something I believe that it's really true and I will try to prove it. Or even as I told you to find some questions and answer them that USA is not fully controlling the Middle East right now. It's a fact, I believe. Uh, uh, and also Biden did a lot of things since he started. Uh, and some of them, which really I noticed that he made like vice versa, undo many things happened uh, or achieved by, or decided by the Trump's uh, administration. Uh, but in the same time, Will he continue this way or what challenges may confront him? Mm -hmm. Then we'll go to my questions. Before the questions, maybe I think we need to talk about what are the main goals of the Middle East uh, and of USA in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I believe there are, there are five main goals. 
and th from these five main goals which should be achieved by United States, then the challenges will come to Biden. Energy security. In this point, exactly, that I think three main points to the United States. First of all, securing energy resources to, to itself and to its allies, which always announced, that's fine. Second point, to the advantage of selling oil only in the US dollars, which is very important to the United States. And the third point, that this, both of the first two points, this enable the United States to control, let me say it, control the industrial countries. Because when it has its hand on the oil, so I think it can do something with its competitors. A lot of several countries are in a very good ground, same ground of the United States and security, political, but not maybe not the same level uh, economic wise. So competition comes here economically, so they have to control industrial countries sometimes when they need. Second goal, fully support to Israel. Uh, it, it doesn't mean this word looks provocative, but I see it in different way that fully supported doesn't mean to be with Israel against others because Israel is now to have bigger community among the Arab region. But the fully support, which is used to, which I think it will be a little bit changing in the coming time from fully support to just support maybe or other level. So this was for the one of the main strategic goals of the United States which is hegemony, demonation, because when I have a country inside the Middle East like a backbone and it can keep the regional order the way I like, I mean, as United States through Israel, then it will, be, it will help a lot maybe through Israel, especially after sometimes many several years passed through the Middle East and it was like nationalism, President Nasser after like the peace treaty, but still it took time to be really to have Israel with a specific role in the in the region, which may help the main strategy of the United States and its goal in, in the Middle East. Fighting terrorists. And that's what they are doing right now. And maybe they will do more some time, but not the same concentration as they were doing before, but they have to fight ter terrorists because I believe three main challenges to any US strategy which is civil war or conflicts between two countries, especially in the same region, which influenced by the United States and terrorism. This really break a lot of issues in the American strategy. The fourth one, confronting its competitors because China and Russia will never, would never stay in their location. They have to go out and one of the regions the United States is the Middle East, and they have to keep concentration in the Middle East to confront its competitors. And the last one, uh, which is maintaining freedom of the US maritime navigation and even global maritime navigation through the Red Sea, through the Indian Ocean, through Suez Canal, East Mediterranean, up to and from the United States. Then I go to the second one, which is changes and challenges confront Biden administration in the Middle East. First question, is it possible to return to the joint comprehensive plan of action? I don't think so, why? Because Iran itself, because you know, Trump withdrew with his country from GCPOA that was in May, I think 2018. From May 2018 until now, the reaction by Iran was more internal. So they increased their capabilities. They didn't reach really the very serious and critical level, but they are almost there. That's why, yeah, it takes time, but it became different. So if we would like to go back to the GCPOA, Iran must go back to before May 2018, which I think something like almost impossible or very difficult. And then, is it possible to restore US strategic alliance with Turkey? Turkey spe specifically. I believe that Turkey has two main problems with USA, and USA is currently has a, a specific main problem with Turkey. 
as I mentioned in the second uh, uh, seminar, this is the last one concerning the Mediterranean, that Turkey is very important to both Russia and United States because several reasons. One of them is geostrategic location. From its geostrategic location, we see uh, Strait of Bosporus, Bosphor we call it, and Strait of Dardanelles, which allow allies or others even to go through from Asian and East Mediterranean Sea to the Black Sea. So Russia does need this passage to be very free for it and even to keep Turkey friendly. USA needs this passage also. And as I mentioned, even that Turkey is, is at the front in the front defensive line of NATO, the southern one since 1950 something. And that's why it's very important to them. But the two main problems from the United States toward Turkey is number one, supporting the Kurds. Kurds and um, the Kurdish, I mean, for especially in Syria. And this may, that was because to do one of the main goals is to fight in terrorism because they were fighting ISIS, Daesh. So, and that's why Turkey said that USA is double standard because they support uh, 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 YGB, which they are prescribed as terrorists at the same time to fight terror terrorism. And the Kurds, as, as we all aware, that 40% of them, they are in Turkey. So if they have the independence somehow, if they are promised by the United States, then maybe it will divide or affect seriously specific countries like Syria, Iraq, Iran, and mainly Turkey, which has the 40% of the Kurdish population. The second point, which is Fathallah Ujlan, because Fathallah Ujlan is against Turkey, and he was condemned that he was the one of the main reason of the military coup in middle of July 2016 against Turkey, the failed one. So USA was condemned to support them. But in the same time, Turkey also, you know, after the S-400, which it pulled from Russia, so that was really big panic with the F-35, the American one, because of the not only uh, security reason of this uh, as a kind of equipment, military equipment uh, system of NATO, but also technological problem because if you have F-35 and you have its enemy in industrial country like Turkey, then maybe the circuit of F-35 has to be taken to be, you know, uh, uh, feed it to the missile to not to hurt the F-35 as friendly uh, aircraft in the same country has the two missiles or the two weapons against each other. So deal is a century and the annexation. As we are aware that Biden, during his uh, Obama administration when he was vice president, he was against settlements, annexations, uh, even shifting uh, uh, the American embassy to Jerusalem and many other things done uh, during Trump's era. But is he really able to change? Even he declared that I cannot go back for several reasons. And I have learned it from Dr. John Psycho even just, and I mentioned that in my paper that the, the Jewish lobby and, and Israeli lobby inside the United States support even Biden. So he doesn't want, I'm not Biden himself, but I mean the Democrats. So he doesn't want to lose this bunch of people I mean, uh, or Luby inside his country. So it's not easy to go back anyway. Uh, and escalation of the crisis in the Middle East, they are escalating. And if we go back to the strategic goals of the United States, we can find something specific like in Yemen, in Yemen, for example. So, you know, the humanitarian, humanitarian aid problem is increasing uh, and, you know, horses are not, are prescribed as a terrorist group. And this, you know, is new enemies to the United States. This is number one. Second, I mean, I like horses because you have also Qaeda as terrorist group inside Yemen, and also threatening the maritime navigation routes, which is one of the main goals of the United States in Syria. And so if I go back to Syria, you will find something that Assad, Assad is still controlling his country. And at the same time, Daesh is still there and other terrorist group. And remember, and maybe one of our colleagues will talk about that today, that Jabhat al-Nusra, which became Fath al-Sham, it's one of the lonely groups preferred to stay inside Syria and not to go out to Africa 
just to keep its identity and it is belonging to Al Qaeda, which is very important here. And then this saying two things, not I, I belong to Qaeda, which is coming to our, our, our seminar today, but the important thing in month session, which I'm talking right now, that is keeping one of the big terrorist, bigger, biggest terrorist groups inside Syria, inside the region, which is one of the main goals, as I told you, to fighting a uh, terrorist group in the region. In Lebanon, remember that Lebanon, Lebanon is still influenced by Iran. So, the coming relations between Iran and USA is very important for the future of Lebanon. I think so. So we have to be very careful when we look at it. If I go to restore the countries of the region, the alliance, trust, restore the trust of the countries, something very important here. Some time ago, we didn't care, I mean, in our region about Democrats or Republicans, but since, since, you know, Obama, after the Arab Spring, let me say, they became very important to us. So, Arab, don't trust Democrats, don't like them, because of specific U.S. values, you know, uh, and which we call it Western democracy, Western democracy, I'm sorry. At the same time, even after Trump, a lot of Arab countries, they don't trust him as Republicans, or even the Republicans, why? He did a lot, he achieved a lot to Israel, more than his allies, other allies of the United States, like for example, the Gulf countries or like Egypt or even, he did a lot for all of them, but look at Israel. Israel now they have Golan Heights, new uh, 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 American embassy and others, by the way, in Jerusalem, uh, they have the settlements, as I mentioned, uh, the deal of century, uh, uh, Israeli American way, which, Maybe I think it's a good opportunity, but not like by Palestinian. But anyway, what can I say? Israel earned a lot. That that earned a lot or gained a lot. That really not, it, it, I mean, reduce the trust of the Republicans that still supporting Israel is the main goal to United States. Is it possible to maintain the balance of the toward region, you know, between US values and US interests? When I, when I call interest here, it, I mean, all types or all aspects of interest. The problem here, what? what? This is here very sensitive, especially to Biden. Biden during Obama era was against stepping like, for example, Mubarak, President Mubarak, the Egyptian president, down. Same like Hillary Clinton. For sure he is a democratic person, even he, he believe in democracy and so on, uh, but he is not very realistic. Okay, like Obama. But for sure also, he is not very pragmatic like Trump. So I think he will try to make a balance between values and interests here. Not very realistic with values or, or, or very, very, how can I say with, uh, yeah, yeah, with values, because I don't find the word in English, not very pragmatic. So he will find a line in between. I think so. This is my thinking. So, and, and it's really a challenge for him. It's really a challenge because uh, before I go to the next one, see, peace treaty with Egypt, human rights in different countries and the Arab from at least American point of view, uh, armament and military aids to, uh, to several countries, including one of the most important one, Egypt. And many things are connected. So, and by the way, Human rights, one of the protocol attachment of the peace treaty, not the military aids, peace treaty between Israel and Egypt, but again, they keep on the military aids because of interest, the US goal, avoiding US values. I think that he will continue, I mean Biden, same way, somehow in the middle. Then is it possible to restore the prestige of the US? U.S. now, you know, not as before. And I think as it was very important and it did something with Russia, I think also the prestigious uh, uh, phase must come somehow to the United States. So uh, especially in front of Russia and China. And as Eric told me, I remember very nice word. Yes, still America first, 
as you know from Biden, but not alone. So yeah, China and Russia is there, but prestige of the United States, I think, this is very important to United States to be restored somehow. And I remember very well when Turkey was expanding and Russia with its armed forces, and everybody was saying, United States doesn't, doesn't do anything, everybody is moving when uh, 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 everywhere they want, like the military exhibition uh, of Saudi Arabia in Yemen, and Obama didn't like to support it with military, only with logistics later and, uh, uh, and intelligence. But this is the security dynamics. So how he will deal with a lot of security dynamics because he must believe now there are other participants, other sharing countries, Russia and China. So negotiation, all. So he will have to undermine Russia somehow because I believe that China is depending on Russia. And I added one uh, attachment, you know, in my paper talking about increasing of the relations between Russia and China since 2019 only. I wrote five points and there are in my book, eight points, which I did, I know, I mean, globally. So, and this give indications that how China will depend more on Russia for specific reason in the region I mean that Russia has the experience of the involvement in many crises and, uh, 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 and issues in the Middle East. And it has the experience. I think China will need it somehow. Maybe they are doing something even right now. Last one, and thank you, Eric, for this, that what Biden administration will do if Mohammed bin Salman becomes, for any reason, king tomorrow. Because I remember very well the statement of the White House saying, from today we will deal with King Salman as a, as a king of Saudi Arabia, starting from today. That was 16 February, I think, or something or 20. So I think it's also offensive. It's embarrassing somehow, according not only to the culture, but Mohammed bin Salman was a masterpiece in Saudi Arabia in the last four years. So what happened if he becomes tomorrow? It's another new challenge, yeah. It looks good to everybody, but maybe it will be challenged if something happened in the short term and he became um, a king. Remarks and future perspective. I have two main remarks. Number one, as I mentioned in my introduction, US is not no longer the fully influencing the Middle East region. And China, Russia are there. This is one of the most important. Second one, Will USA will have to do like Russia? How? What is the main difference between Russian and American foreign policy with allies or non-allies? USA, I think, they work in a grand strategy, which was well known to United States, maybe national security strategy or bigger, bigger, even a grand strategy. And then they have the specialized strategies, military, economic, uh, uh, political, whatever the strategy, health, and so on. And then the foreign relation with other countries within these strategies. So you feel it's very systematic, but not flexible. No flexibility. So that's why you find them, according to their strategy, they have only two lists, friends and enemies. Nothing in the middle, not that easy. Russia, no. Russia, they go piece by piece because you don't have this grand strategy. They are more realistic. And I have my strategy for my country and my foreign relations, and you don't know them. Just I'm with you. And then when I see countries like Turkey and Iran, mainly they are the biggest regional power, the true regional powers in the region. They are the true historical empires. They are really the true promising countries if they were more free and liber liberal. So, I mean, free to move with their powers and cap capabilities. So not to be with one of them against the other, but to manage their competition between them. This is the containment policy, which everybody knows. It's how to manage competition between the competitors not to, have to be with other against one against other. 
and even Israel became part of that. Those are three main competitors. Look at the relation with Saudi Arabia, at the relation with Emirates. They have special case by case, case by case. And they do always among competitors, as I told you, when, it need, when it's needed, containment policy. USA doesn't do that. They are more skillful in this level. I mean, the Russians. Is it, it, is it will be in the American strategy in the coming future, or they will continue with their non-flexibility as American that in dealing in foreign policy. Confrontation, I think that Biden, if I'm not wrong, yeah. Uh, I think that Biden will have, as I said, a big inclusive grand strategy. Maybe, listen, any strategy, I mean, like, okay, for example, wider or greater Middle East, it had mainly three or four uh, main pillars. One of them was democracy. Look at the Chinese Belt and Road, no democratic pillar or dimension in Belt and Road, right? So I think as China learned, I, I don't say it's good or bad, remember this, remember this, but I'm talking about realis realism, this is a title, what on the ground to verify what's going on the ground right now, okay? So maybe, democracy and this type of approach from United States will be a little bit in their grand strategy and some other element. Will it be more flexible, as I said, thinking about containment policy, thinking about something different from enemies and friends to see more interests and less interests with the countries? Will it think this way? Uh, his flexibility in the foreign policies, I think, will depend in two axes. First of all, restore U.S. strategic allies. Why U.S. is losing a strategic allies from all what I mentioned before? Mainly the way of dealing. And here, as I told you, the balance between values and interests. Not very pragmatic, like Trump. Not very realistic or valuable, like Obama. I think. Second, to reduce US list of enemies, as I mentioned. That's why maybe Biden declared, for example, just for example, you know, it's non actor state like Houthis, but he declared, but it's part of the country of Yemen, he declared that we will lift, you know, this we will lift Houthis from terrorist organization, proscribed terrorist organization, like for example. So, and also Iran, what he will do with Iran in the future. Uh, maybe he will be even more than, than Obama, you know, in deal with Iran. Iran is enemy. Iran is a threat for many other reasons. But again, not to make it enemy, not to put uh, always on the corner of the enemy. I, maybe he will think this way and other countries for sure. But it will be taken, not even as I told, it's not shifting from enemies to friend uh, list. But the most important interest this is the main frame I think maybe he will think about. Fi final point, which is, I think he will think, as I mentioned, of containing the revealing, the competitors. No more intervention in internal issues. Rem they, they remember for sure, you're, everybody knows about leading from behind strategy or ideology uh, which has or principle which has been mentioned by Obama. I think he will continue on this. But remember, leading from behind doesn't doesn't mean that I'm away. Big difference between leading from behind and acting from behind. Action, or even acting directly. Action will be by the countries, uh, like what's going on in Egypt when it's fighting its own terror, terrorist groups. You know, which are fighting inside, but supporting Egypt more, even in the military aid. Rather than giving Egypt tanks, airplanes, and so on, blah, 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 giving them anti terrorism or fighting or counter terrorism weapons and ammunition and so on. Okay, this is all from my side. Uh, I hope I didn't take time and uh, I'm ready for any questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, generous side of the name. Um, so we, we, we take questions from the floor. Um, is there any questions or comments? 
would you just um um raise your hand by by using blue hand um <coughs> actually we are now waiting for oh general morale bit he, he was once in but uh he was in yeah i think he was but, but no, no he, he he's again out so we, our staff is searching for him <laughs> so uh, so uh, so thank, thank you thank you for for your presentation a very broad um insight and uh, uh well so you, you're you know uh basically your assessment for the first one or two months of Biden administration is, is you know, not high. Um, so, you know, oh, oh, oh Dr. Kakizaki is raising her hand. So um, please, um, Dr. Kakizaki, uh, would you make questions? Uh, yeah. Um... Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gonein. Uh, so um, I am curious about Biden's policy or how can he bring back NATO into the, into the, uh, the international relations of the Middle East? Uh, you didn't talk about NATO's role in the Middle East or North Africa, but now NATO is internally uh, divided. We have the uh, different interests, competing interests and positions between, let's say, France, Turkey, and Italy toward Libya, for instance. And so uh, NATO is not really a coherent, internally uni unified uh, intergovernmental organization. What can Biden do about NATO? How can he bring back this institution for the uh, stability of the region? Any thoughts? Thank you. Oh, yeah. First of all, let me tell you two information, just one information I have received it from uh, Egyptian, uh, from, uh, I mean, one of my friends, I mean, official somehow. Uh, I knew uh, that, you know, Egypt and Emirates were almost out from NATO, not to be extended, were almost in their in the Mediterranean dialogue and ICI, but just a few days ago that Egypt has been extended for two years with NATO, uh, Emirates and other countries in ICI extended for six months. So to be six months by six months. If I go back, I think what I noticed that Biden is doing something, if I, before I come back to NATO, not very nice which is doing the same policy of Trump of reversing what the previous person was doing. Like Trump was always reversing everything Obama was doing. And now Biden is reversing or undoing everything Trump was doing. One of them, the relation with international organizations or regional organizations, one of them NATO. So I hope that I believe even it has been declared by Biden that all international organization, our relations with NATO will get back and we will reconsider, you know, our participation with the, the fight, I mean, the funding, I mean, even from United States to NATO and so on, that it will be taken and considered not like before. So I believe that, I hope it's away from Trump, as I told you, not undoing, but I believe that he will consider NATO for specific reasons, away from Trump. As you, as you notice, I mentioned that something about the grand strategy. Grand strategy of the United States is including several aspects. One of them is the military strategy and which really United States depend on and it will continue to depend on. And I think if the United States will not intervene as US armed forces inside any crisis or any problem inside any issue in specific country with American forces, then it will have to depend on NATO somehow because existence, military existence is still needed. So, and then it will be through something like NATO, for example. And remember that the biggest participation of NATO is United States. 
and also one of the biggest interests always achieved uh, military wise through NATO and even sometimes political. So I think I think he will fix what, according to his view, what Biden spoiled in relations, specifically with NATO. He will use he will try to think in a grand strategy, as I told you, within the bigger strategy, which I think is under process right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 you, in your presentation, you know, um, yeah. the, uh, one of the key ally of the United States is still Turkey, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, there is a. Uh, of course, there are so much you know sensitive issue between Turkey and the United States, and um, particularly by President Biden himself uh, is not so you know highly regarded by, by you know Turkish officials. So, uh, do you think you know still in in, in these political uh, differences uh, uh, aside? Um, the 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 logic, you know, uh, the purpose of ally alliance would prevail between you know U.S. and Turkey, and, and you know, um, in, in a way, Turkish American security relations will be intact in, in the in the you know coming four years. Uh, is, uh, do you for, uh, is it foreseeable uh, in, in if there is any you know drastic change? Uh, on the Turkey, you know, front for for U.S. security policy in the Middle East. I read an article maybe one year ago to Elam Berman. He's my friend. He's American one. Mm -hmm. And the first line of the article, it's a statement by some Turkish friend mm -hmm. of him, mm -hmm. saying that this year will be the worst year of relations between Turkey and USA. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned that every year this word is repeated. Mm -hmm. And every year it's noted that every year is worse than before. Mm -hmm. And I think, I don't know, maybe it's Democrat or again it's Biden, again it's Trump that time even at this. Uh, and, but I think, yes, why? Mm -hmm. Why am, I, I give you this introduction of answer. See how many years that accumulate worsening you know, in relations mm -hmm. between Turkey, accumulate, remember, it's not stable relation as bad, but worsening, worse and worse and worse every year. How many other years, if they decide to do something better, it will take. Mm -hmm. This is one angle. Mm -hmm. Number two, remember what I mentioned here, three main points between, main points, other several points, mm -hmm. between USA and Turkey. Kurds mm -hmm. supporting Fathala Ogren, and on the other hand, S400 for Turkey. Mm -hmm. So now two, two, how can I say, two dimensions or two points to answer your question. These two must be overcome. The accumulate, accumulate years of bad relation and the specific points of bad relation between both of them. So I think this will need to, to end up what makes problem between us first. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us, like, remember, what increase even the problem between Turkey and USA and create a new problem between Turkey and Israel, supporting Israel to Kurds and asking for, announcing for independence for Kurdistan, right? So it's increasing as USA, for example, I don't say again, I'm with or again, but as USA declared by Trump, for example, that supremacy of Morocco of Western Sahara. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So maybe Turkey is thinking about something opposite. Mm -hmm. You know, recognition mm -hmm. of God stand that they are not whatever. Mm -hmm. They cannot be independent country. Mm -hmm. They cannot be independent. This is requested by United States to makes the relation much better, mm. right? This is mm. one of the things. And also S-400, mm. the, the main point also Russia itself, 
Russia is here, it became not like small stone in the throat, but big stone over here, I can say, you know, to United States in its relation with Turkey. That's it. Thank you very much. And now for we, General Giuseppe Morabito is in the room. So we now move on to the Africa part. And uh, so again, we, thank you. Um, I, uh, thank you very much, General Gonem, as always. And uh, um, it's, uh, uh, we totally um, depend on you in, in organizing such, such a series of um, scholars and practitioners. So, so thank you again. And uh, we now go on to this Sub-Saharan Sahel part. We have three speakers. Uh, first, first of all, um, um, Brigadier General Giuseppe Morabito, now uh, director of the Rome Capital uh, Civil Protection Department. And uh, he will talk about um, Libya, uh, uh, it, um, um, about its prolonged conflict and uh, its repercussions on both European and uh, African sides. So um, here, yeah. Uh, um, General Morabito, um, thank you again for, for overcoming te technical issues and uh, we're happy to ha having you. Seems here. to be okay, seems to be. Thank you, thank yeah. you very much and uh, it's your turn. Um, like... Yes, thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, good morning from the Eternal City, the most beautiful city of the world. It's early morning in Rome and uh, uh, just move. Uh, sorry for for Sayed. I had no chance to uh, to to listen to all the speeches of Sayed, but I know him, so he is for sure moderate, but Turkey. So it's it's okay. It's normal. Uh, so I I I I hope you can see my presentation. Please confirm. Yes. Yes. So. Um, this is my presentation today. Uh, I, I, I hope to stay in the 20 minutes that we have uh, today. And uh, first of all, as I like always, I want to introduce the area. This is the area. Uh, Libya is in the top down. You see uh, the Mediterranean Sea. You need know what that does it mean, Mediterranean. Mediterranean is in the middle of the heart. And if you look, my country is in the middle of the heart, Mediterranean. Med is a middle, terra, terraneo, terra is heart. So, and you see where is my city, where I am now. In the city, in the center of Mediterranean, where is Italy. So when something happens in the sea, in this water, we are very interested because we live in the center of the, of the, of the country. In, in few words, uh, 10 years after the 2011 revolution, that overview, uh, Gaddafi, uh, has been resolved. The, the war was been resolved. In October 2020, this is fired between the two main warning parties. On one side, the Marshal Haftar, and on the other hand, uh, uh, the government, but the Marshal Haftar is important, but he leads the armed wing of the House of Representatives, HOR in Tobruk. That if you remember the map, is near the sea. And the government of national country, GNA, and remain fragile. So what this does it mean? There is no peace. And the country is a potential result of energy riches is undermined by parochial and denied the ruling class. This is the main problem of Libya. Uh, what I want to say is that it is important strategically, uh, the location of Libya in the center of Mediterranean basin, because it's a source of trade, power, and, and a source of its troubles. The foreign powers, and we will see in a few moments which one, seek to establish food holds on the ground, boots on the ground or foots on the ground. These foreign powers are showing no willingness to comply with the request of TAR. Aftar in this moment is in, in vantage in the, in the conflict. And the GNA to withdraw the proxy forces from January 2013. So the Libyan in 2013 and, and 23, that could set the country to a new precipice. If I don't go, 
it will be a problem. Meanwhile, both Libyan sides have been remaining setting the stage for resumption of a more intense cyclopid. Where is no peace, the two parties not having conflict, they are rebuilding their logistics. This is very important, Benuni. In any peace, there is a rebuilding of, of the, when is a, is a moment of, uh, of peace, uh, no fire, no combat, no combat activity, there is a rebuilding of peace. And there is uh, a terrible humanitarian disaster and in this moment in the area. And this could become worse because an unsettled Syria caught up the persistent civil war, destabilized North Africa, this is the point, and generated and controlled immigration flow and terrorism threats in Europe. We have to start to connect. What is the connection between North Africa and Europe? The control of migration and the possible to have terrorists in the middle of immigrants is always with, what, with a problem. External powers and non-state actors have exploited the prolonged diplomatic absence in the United States and Europe, Europeans Union. What does it mean? In the last year, most probably, the, the Americans were not very interested in the area also because, because of the Chinese, the Chinese virus, this virus from Wuhan created a problem. So the population in, it, in Europe was looking more to internal problem than external. No, we're not looking south. And the recent history show that especially the US diplomatic involvement is key for restoring balance in, to the country and warning the restrictive influences. If Americans don't use their, their soft power, their power in the area, the other country can gain advantage in, the, in, this, in, this, uh, in this area. The external actors are drawn to Libya for geopolitical, economic, and ideological reasons. This is important. It, economic and geopolitical. Ideological is less. In the central Mediterranean basin and close to Italy, Libya, deep water. This is very important. Ports provide to chance to control a substantial sea area and vital trade routes. The more than at least one third of the commercial shipping in the world is in the Mediterranean Sea. This is very important. And if you have a port in the area, you control the area because you get refueling, you can send your submarine, your warship there. This is very important. And, it's, and the, these harbor are in North Africa. In Libya, no, not only Libya. Libya can also, this is the pain point. One is another point. Libya can also be an important energy power. It's one of the world's most productive oil field. And as well as natural gas and solar potential power. But while a rich energy resource, Libya needs to import everything. So Libya has the capacity to sell oil through Italian company. There is a, a, a pipeline that moves from Libya to Sicily in the central Mediterranean. It's called Green Stream. The owner of this pipeline is an Italian company, ENI. But Libya gained money from this selling oil, but they have to buy all food, weapons, electricity, whatever is needed for reconstruction, they have to buy. And in the post-2001 civil war is important because the war, the civil war, has destroyed all the infrastructure of Libya. There is nothing that works in Libya. So now we, I, I hope to have given a picture of the situation, and I want to show you the actors. The actors are these two men, at the very beginning, and I, I heard that uh, Sayed was telling something, something about the, the Americans in, in the area. Uh, Donald Trump was not very interested in the area, and uh, there was not a, a, an intervention. Usually, the democratic have the, the more activity of intervention, are more active and more like more intervention. If you, if you have seen at the, the news of this morning, this morning, the, we had the information that there were the bombing in Syria. So connect the Republican, less 
active with soft power, democratic as usual, more intervention. So, and this night, yesterday, in Syria was the first bombing. So, we will see what happened in, in Libya with a change from a Republican to a Democratic. These two guys, these two guys took advantage, both of them, from the absence of American, because the Russian have support one of the side we will see later, and the supporting one of the side they have the advantage in some ports, air base, and the Chinese want to enter and to rebuild some of the harbor of the port in the north of Libya because if they have a port, rebuild the port, they make a reconstruction. It's a business because the Libyan can pay with the petrodollar, petrodollars. But they also have the chance to control a very important port, point of point of starting point, the entering point, like you as you like in the north of Africa. So is the arrival of the Chinese of the north of Africa. If they participate to the reconstruction, is important. Mr. Stoltenberg, NATO. As you know, NATO was uh, the main actor when it was the time to, to overthrow Gaddafi. Now NATO is, a, is, a, is not a clear position in the point all the nation move in alone, but it's not a clear indication of what will be the following idea of NATO, but NATO is interested in the peace of North Africa. We will see later. This is Europe. Uh, Mr. Borrell, uh, High Representative uh, uh, for Foreign Affairs of, of Europe. And what he say? That for Europe is important to stop the flow of arms. When you see of this operation Irini, it's a, it is a naval operation that is still working in the Mediterranean Sea. And this is the operation that doesn't work, in my opinion. This is absolutely my opinion. Because this operation was well, we thought at the very beginning to stop the flow of weapons in Libya to support the, the party in, in conflict, but it's not, it was not working. Now it's in, inside, but the problem is that the ships of Irini, they can expect a ship coming in the area only if the owner, the nation's, nation, sending nation of a ship is, does, is ag agree. So if you don't agree, you don't can ship and for sure, Turkey. I heard the Sayed speaking of Turkey will never respect this uh, this rule. Turkey, Turkey is the main problem in the Mediterranean Sea and the main problem in North Africa. We will see later why. Turkey uh, has a strange policy, be, and I I use this picture because I want to show you that the, Turkey is still a NATO member but is not respecting all the rule of NATO. But in this moment, uh, there is no discussion internally on NATO if NATO, Turkey can be sent out or they have to accept the, their presence, but they don't respect the rule. And this is a big, big issue. There is an old Latin sentence. It's better to have with you a bad friend than a good enemy. In this moment, we have inside of alliance a bad friend. And now coming back, Lysia, uh, as I said to you, is, as, and I want to move a little bit the West, uh, has, uh, has also become the locus of ideological competition over political Islam between Turkey and Qatar on one end, and the Arab quartet of Egypt, United Emirates, Everett, Saudi Arabia, and Bahrain. It's very important, it's very important that you uh, that you look at this uh, because is look at the nation because uh, uh, look at the nation because uh, we will we'll look at the photo in a few minutes that uh, we explain you what is happening in the area geopolitical competition has in it intensified in the recent months uh, Turkey is as Sayed probably said is supporting a, G a GNA uh, and um, they are taking uh, and the control on, uh, of the uh, Al Watiya Air Base. Sorry for my Arabic. If I'm not good, uh, Sayed will say better with me. And uh, uh, where are they? F 16 that plan, but they also based on the future of Misurata Naval Base. Again, Misurata Naval Base. Cetaki want a base in the north of Africa. 
and uh, and uh, another point during the war and this is a big issue for a NATO country um, thousands of Syrian uh, Syrian fighters with a sort of terrorist task force were fighting in Libya this is an indication of the expansionism of foreign policy of Turkey and coming in Africa from Sudan to Somalia, Somaliland, and all the territory in the center of Africa, south of Sahel, also in the Sahel, Turkey has established embassy, and, and the Turkish airline has established the 54 airline destination. Just to give you an example, at the beginning of the intervention of the um, of the war or intervention in the war in Libya of Turkey, there were a lot of flights from Istanbul and uh, uh, Ankara to, um, to, uh, to Tripoli. And for sure, my friends, I don't think that there were thousands of Turkish going in on holiday in Libya during this period. Probably there, are other, there were other people on this plane. And at the fair, when the, when, uh, um, the government of Tripoli won, or at least had the advantage. We had, uh, was traced uh, a lot of flights, a charter flight of Turkish line from Tripoli to Azerbaijan, Baku. And I don't think so, but the Libyan at that time were going on holiday in Azerbaijan after their war. So if we want to discuss a little bit, uh, is, should be a topic uh, or uh, the task for another conference. What are doing these people flying on the charter of Turkish airline? But uh, uh, why? Because Erdogan is trying to distract the public opinion of Turkey from severe domestic problem. And he is also giving, the, uh, explained recent provocation to Italy, Cyprus, Greece, Israel, and, uh, and Egypt. And uh, okay, and Sayed can tell you something more about this kind of progression of in, in, in from his uh, mother country. I repeat, this is a very bad approach for a NATO member country. On the rival side, again, Egypt and the UAE and Russia support Aftar. Don't forget UAE in this moment. Egypt uh, from the other side. Because Egypt and uh, Sayed can tell you better than me has historical ties with the Libyan Eastern coastal, coastal region of Syria, Syria and Anka. Um, Egypt want to in, in what what increase its influence uh, because what's a million of, uh, of Egyptian workers go in the, in this area of Libya. Don't forget that during the, the conflict, the Egypt, the president of Egypt, several times, the general, several times said. That, if the, if the force of the government of, of Tripoli arrive to this point, this red line, Egypt will enter, will enter in the territory of Libya. But it's not good. The UAE seek to weaken the Muslim Brotherhood. This is another problem around the world, including Libya, and seek access to the port of Benghazi to augment this, augment the influence in the Mediterranean Sea. Also, also the um, the UAE intend to enter in the Mediterranean Sea and uh, because they want to influence also Middle East and South Africa because we have, they have a lot of money, a lot of company, a lot of budget that they have to implement the use of this budget. And okay, as I said, the Russia seek the access to the energy sources, ports and naval base in the Mediterranean because now it's difficult for them and uh, have a contract and sell arms arms in change of oil, of oil, of the of the, of the market of the oil. Uh, so Moscow receive access to strategic location, military bases, such as in Egypt, a value of economic resources, as uh, such in Sudan. So Russia is in Egypt, Russia is in Sudan. All these, they are fighting on the boots on the ground in Libya, an indicator of the interest in all Africa. These two countries is important. L'Africa, Africa, like elsewhere, Russia also exploits local social instability to attempt to build influence. This is very important. All these actors, please consider this sentence, prefer an instable Libya. 
a unified Libya with a single government that may not be dependent from the support of the other nation or they can be supported by a democratic country, can jeopardize their influence and the physical presence. This is very important. So I don't expect in a near, in a near future peace in Libya. Remember a few minutes ago, I was telling you, look at the country, Ibrahim Akrad Accord, and the country are Israel and United States, but the two countries very important are Bahrain and UAE. Remember, in Bahrain, UAE, good relation with Syria and Libya, with Russia and Libya, but signed this agreement. So just to, 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 to show you the complexity of the area. This is the great success of Trump. The, probably uh, he was not at the beginning, he was not considering the capacity of this success, but it's a big, very big success. But this success match a little bit with the alliance in Libya. As UAE is allied with Russia, in this moment is signing with, with the United States of America and uh, with Israel. Bahrain is important because it's a little country, probably you know in the map. It's a completely connected, dependent from the agreement with Saudi Arabia. Bahrain never does anything without the agreement of Saudi Arabia. So most probably if Bahrain is in this agreement, in the near future, we will see other, also Saudi Arabia liking this agreement. Don't forget that yesterday, the new president of the United States of America had his first speech, telephone speech with the king of Saudi Arabia. Peace in the Middle East, this is important, and this is a willing. If we have a peace in the Middle East, probably we will have more interest, more stability, more flood of money. But we, after the war in Iraq, we see where we will, there is, there has not been any war in the Middle East, but the, the country are fighting in Africa. Let's move to a real European country. Uh, we are most interested in suppressing terrorism and migration flow. And uh, for sure, as access of energy, but this is also a, a Japanese problem, a chess of energy. So it's not only a problem of Italy. Or, but lacking like common strategy, Europe largely remains reactive to Libya developments. With division among Brussels and Berlin and above Paris, uh, we are we are causing in France and Rome, a European country have a adopted different and sometimes outright competition and contemporary approach to Libya. The two essential teams that are relation with Russia and the persisting distance are on no, we require serious work and verification by Berlin, Paris and Rome, Toro, Washington and Moscow. And for sure, Beijing. On the other hand, the Berlin distance is on the strategic autonomy of Europe is, is very strange because the president of France wants this strategic autonomy. Also, he works in this direction with the help of uh, with building of European pillar because of the of the future election. He wants to give a, 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 a big sentence, a big statement before of election. But this match match a lot with the, what the president of the the, the chancellor or Angela Merkel is doing. Also, because she, also she is going to be replaced. Moving to China, uh, it was a was a, a strategic exuberance over the last past twenty five years has been favored by the West. Uh, what I want to say in Africa, there is a there is a, a laxity in Africa, confused the concentration of Middle East event with the grown of radical Islamism. This is a big problem. At the same time, the euphoria over the integration of the Sudan has made Europe forget of the persisting and, and underlying Russian factor. Neo-imperialism, imperial dynamism feed the all national roots and also events on the case of Turkey. Unfortunately, we not read the cohesion in, in Europe. This is a big problem. Uh, and Turkey is taking advantage of this. Anyway, 
North, uh, this is another point that is important during the pandemic. The North-South relation has many positive aspects, especially in the, for energy. And uh, because of energy, because of we had found a lot of gas in the waters of Egypt. And this is a good point for Egypt in the future. And Egypt is the most populous country of Africa. So we are 100 million of, uh, 100 million of Egyptian, 100 million of Egyptian will have advantage on this. And, uh, and this is very important for us. Uh, this, is, this trend must have seen in a positive light because we fuel development and could continue with uh, new source in European markets. Given uh, retail HC dependence of the Russian sources. So see if, if the European find in the north of Africa some gas, some oil, some power basin is very important because we don't look anymore at Russia. Uh, and uh, and uh, Russia will, will change its policy in the area. Just to tell you, look at right now, what is the situation? Now Europe receives gas from Africa, but in this moment, also if you consider, look at my country, this is transit country to Europe. The gas arrive from Libya, Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco, entering Spain, entering Italy in Sicily with the Green Stream, but also from Turkey and from Greece, and then again in Italy going in the direction of North. So this is the situation in the basin. If you look south, and we have power from south, we change the balance in Europe. For this reason, is important North Africa in this moment. Gas, energy. And don't consider in this map, we don't see what we have found, what the NA has found in front of it. This is another migration route. This is a problem. If you look at the migration route in a few moments, you will see that this is the data uh, of the last year. Then uh, I stop in October because during the winter season, the flood of people is reduced, but we'll start again, we'll start again in March, most probably. When during the bad season, no, a lot of both people don't, don't go across the Mediterranean, but we will happen immediately in the near future. Spring is coming in Europe and this is a big issue. Look at this map. This is the map of the migration routes from uh, UNA, UN. Look at the map and look at the exit point. Is the, are the, exit, the same exit point of the gas? On the same route of the oil, look at Egypt, Cairo, Greece. Look at Libya, Italy. Look at Niger, Nigeria, Mali. And then from Algeria, France, from, from Morocco to Spain. This is a, this is a, but the main route is through Italy. For this, you and from Italy, you center of Mediterranean, we arrive in Italy to the center of Europe. And what I told you before, at the end of the war in Libya, the terrorists that were brought in the area from Turkey will find to exit. Not, not, <clears throat> not for sure the money that they gain during the war to open a bar or a pizzeria. Or a, or a, a shop uh, in Italy, but probably they have other intention. So we have to be very careful to be very careful in the flood of the migrants because in the middle of the migrants we can have also some of the terrorists. Sorry, wrong direction. Sorry. Again, this is a very significant photo. This is a terrorist. Like remember the map. And uh, Erdogan is using terrorism to make influence in the area, to have control of the power, to call control of the gas, both in Libya, in Nagorno-Karabakh, and in other area where it is his interest. So this is very significant. A NATO country is using terrorist mercenaries in the area where it can gain advantage in the power conflict of empire in, in gain. Let's go in West Africa. The 2nd of February, uh, France decided to add, uh, this is very important, 
additional troops in West Africa. Italy also will participate with France in this task force Matacuba. This task force, this force is a more a training force, not a combat force, but for sure in the middle of a training, trainers were on combat forces. Most of, and most of these reinforcements would be, would be deployed in the border between Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. If you close your eyes and come back to the slide of immigration, look at Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. It's one of the root of immigration. The then come in Libya. The decision to increase the number of troops deployed in the Sahel Sahara strip of to reach 6,000 soldiers, and this should allow to increase the pressure against the ESS terrorist organization that is uh, something that is uh, acting on behalf of Daesh in the West Sahara. In the West Sahara, we have Daesh still Daesh. France, uh, the supporting country, will not leave a space uh, to who want to destabilize the Sahel. Uh, the, Militants have launched a repeated attack against the local troops in Mali and Niger. Mali and Niger, sending area for immigration. France and the government of West and Central Africa agree to a new approach to make a, this sort of, of coalition of a cell for, to fight the insurgents. It's not only in this area of the cell, probably you heard that. Uh, a couple of days ago, the Italian ambassador in Congo was killed in, a, in an attack, in a terrorist attack. So all Africa is stabilized from ISS, ISS. but the Sahel region, uh, in the Sahel region in West Africa, there are a lot of groups, including Al Qaeda and, and in the Islamic Maghreb and Daesh. This is very, very important for in the situation. And this is a photo that we always use in Italy to say what, what the world is on the other side of the Mediterranean in the north of Africa. Daesh is not defeated, is still alive, and they are still working and training. This, sorry for if, I, if I was a little bit long, but uh, uh, sometimes it's better to folk, tell all and I always use at the end of my briefing this sentence. Why I was speaking of this? Because uh, all of us, I'm an old man of 61 years, but you are younger than me. Uh, my interest in the future, what is the future in Mediterranean? Because uh, uh, I have, uh, the media of the European is 83 years, the Japanese a little bit more, I know. But uh, a man that lives in, in Europe 83 years, so I have at least added 22 years in my future. And I'm interested to live in properly these next 22 years. Thanks a lot again for your attention and I'm ready to answer your question. Thank you very much, General Amorabito, for your excellent presentation and overview of the Italian affairs. In, and we now know how important Italia is in the African affairs and um, energy uh, migration and terrorism all come through Italy, uh, come through um, Libya to Italy and then Europe. So, uh, but uh, um, uh, we, we have um, uh, um, still two presentations that um, abusing my uh, prerogative as a uh, um, uh, um, moderator. C can I ask, uh, one little but big question, you know, um, you know, you 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 are looking at Libya from Italy, and you are most you know close to this you know peculiar country. Uh, in, in in our textbook, uh, world history textbook, in, in in the high school, we learn Roman Empire was divided by <laughs> you know emperor um, and in. in um, in the third century, uh, of course, we all know it was divided into East and West, but on the Mediterranean, you know, Southern Mediterranean side, strangely, it's divided between Libya, presently Libya, uh, you know, Tripoli and Cyrenaica was um, uh, just the, the, the dividing line, dividing, you know, Libya is the uh, uh, Roman Empire, 
uh, southern you know division so it, um that, that you know basic historical fact shows us you know, uh, and this is very difficult for for libyan uh, libyan's modern state to be united integrated um, but from italian point of view how do you see this situation you know libya would be you know intact kept would be kept in intact in the you know long run as some one entity or would you expect more you know different category <laughs> other than modern modern sovereign state you know how do you foresee you know it, it's a very good you know big question but uh, i just want want to ask you you know you, you're from looking okay. at from italy okay thanks a lot for your question first of all don't forget the libya syria are Latin name the given from the Roman, but the area is not the area is important. When you speak of Libya, you speak a territory that is not the historical territory, but was decided at the end of the Second World War. And if you look to the borders, are straight lines, no? Because we're we're drawn at the end of the Second World War, so the the, the border between and Sayed can be more generals with me in explanation between Egypt and Syria was drawn during, at the end of the war, but more probably they divided family or group or clan. For the future of Libya, you have to consider that in Libya there are 142 clan that, are to, that were unified with the, the stick and the carrots using the, the system of the Brits during, at the end of the Second World War from Gaddafi. Gaddafi using the power was able to keep together with more than 100 clan and the country was at a sort of imposed cohesion at that time. Now there is freedom. Is it, in my opinion, this is not the Italian position, is it my personal opinion, it's very difficult to find a solution. Um, it's, it's a dream to consider the opportunity to have election in Libya in the near future. They were expecting to have election in January 2023. But if you have a boots on the ground from, from nation, from army, from other nation, you want to have the control. You want to want to do, no, there is no central authority that can organize the reconstruction. There is no central organization that uh, distribute on the ground uh, to all 142 clans the money that come in the country because of the selling of the oil is a big issue. I don't see in the near future, in the near future, the unified, a unified Libya. Is it more in, is more, in my opinion, is impossible. It's more possible, but it's not what looks at, what is the intention of Europe. It's more possible division of Libya in two countries. And the one side under the influence of Egypt and the other side of the influence of Turkey or other country. This is more probably or will be a fact, a fact in, 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 without any UN decision. In this moment, the high representative of UN for Libya is trying to find a solution for a democratic election. But in my opinion, a, clan, a country with 142 clans, each clan has a little, has, is a little army, a little economic system, a little population will be unified hardly. I don't, I, I don't expect to see Libya unified before of my death. <laughs> so I will not live enough to see Libya unified. This is my, my theory. And this is a big issue, but is, there is no chance to have a unified Libya. Is is only a dream. I hope to have answered your question. Okay, thank you very much for for your your you know explanation, and it's really really helpful for us to to grasp the entire situation. We have still two very heavy uh, presentations, so we we uh, thank you very much, General Marabit, and we we move on to the next presentation by Dr. John Saiko. Um, new jihadist threat in Sahel and Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, as we have already, you know, we, we've been shown, you know, 
uh, the, by the previous presentation, uh, Libya is where Mediterranean meet the Sahara Desert, you know. So, um, so how e we know how easily, you know, uh, you know jihadist um, uh, proliferation uh, is uh, continue on, on this uh, batch of, of land. And uh, so, our, um, Dr. John Saiko is a co founder and director of Brahan Global. And uh, um, so, he has been working on um, African affairs, but from the, the you know uh, diplomatic and uh, um, information uh, point of view. And so uh, today, um, he uh, we ask him to uh, present about the, the recent jihadist rise, uh, the trend of the recent rise in, in, in uh, jihadist activities in Sahel and Sub-Sahara region. So, um, Dr. Saiko, uh, please uh, turn on your microphone, I uh, guess. Yep, I'm here. Um, let me share my screen. Please. Da, da, da. And yes, share. And let me maximize my presentation here. Everybody sees that. Yes, yes, great. First of all, thank you everybody for joining today and thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's a fascinating topic and I think one that's very timely given the situation on the ground uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa and in the Sahel. And also, I, I, one of the things I wanted to turn to is the implications for Japan, um, Japanese government and private interests too, which I think will probably be of, of great interest to the, um, the attendees today. So, I mean, I think the first point to start off with is that Sub-Saharan Africa is in a very bad way right now in terms of specifically around jihadist insurgencies. And so we get two sides of the coin. If you look at places like Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, Central African Republic, I don't really consider these you know, jihadist insurgencies per se, even though there are occasionally religious undertones around them. What I'm talking about are you know, ones that specifically um, refer to jihadist groups, ones that have pledged allegiance to IS or Al Qaeda and are operating around you know, that sort of mantra. And today, you know, there's a few things I just wanna go over. One, why are we seeing this rise? And this rise has very specifically come in the last, really the last 10 years, but the um, effectiveness of these groups as warfighters has increased significantly in the last couple of years. Um, common characteristics of these groups, they're not all the same. We're gonna talk about four of them. Uh, you know, the next one's here in the, you know, the Central Sahel, which um, uh, Dr. Morbido's just covered in a little bit of detail. Also the Lake Chad Basin, which is referring to Boko Haram, uh, which many people I'm sure are familiar with. Then also Northern Mozambique and Somalia, um, which you may or may not be familiar with to some extent. And then also the implications and opportunities for, for Japan. So uh, in a two second nutshell, uh, you know, again, I, every topic that I'm covering here could be devoted two hours, I think. So I'm gonna go relatively quickly. One of the, if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa since independence, say roughly 1960, you can almost look at three sort of eras of conflict. You know, 1960 to the end of the Cold War, roughly 1990, relatively calm. Um, you did see interstate conflicts, uh, largely Cold War driven, uh, lesser, a, a smaller amount of intrastate conflicts and wars of independence and whatnot, although they were there. From about 1990 to the early mid 2000s, you saw this kind of breakdown, this post-Cold War breakdown um, that you saw in Africa, really around the transition to democracy, the loss of Cold War patrons, and you just saw a rise of rebel movements in places like Sierra Leone, Liberia, and I can kind of characterize these as classic rebel movements. These are movements that wanted to capture the capital, take power, and become the governing, governing body. Now, one of the things that you've seen in the last decade or so is this movement away, both by, I think, the jihadist groups and non-jihadist groups toward a, a little bit more of, I say, called the complex insurgencies. And, you know, the jihadists have really taken, I think, advantage of several situations uh, on the ground, which I'll go through. You know, one is, I think, you know, the newfound prominence of these movements, you know, IS and Al Qaeda, they make for, you know, post 9-11 uh, you know, situation in Africa. I was living in South Africa at the time, uh, you know, 2004, 2006 in Pretoria. And I remember seeing, you know, people in Osama bin Laden t-shirts. Now it wasn't because they were necessarily pro-jihad, but it was a sort of anti-imperialist, 
anti-colonialist statement to make. So, um, but the bottom line is these movements did come to light. And I think movements and groups that did have these sorts of um, tendencies now had a sort of, uh, you know, a, a patron to grab, grab onto, even if they weren't formally linked. And I'll, I'll come to that. Um, you also did see in the 2000s onward a lot of radical education sponsored by Saudi Arabia, other Gulf states, you had uh, religious leaders traveling to Saudi, uh, in, a single out Saudi because it was a source of uh, great attention and receiving education in you know, Wahhabist and um, other Salafist sort of education that they then brought back to the continent. To go back very quickly, Christians and Muslims have lived side by side for generations in Africa. Um, most of the all, religion in Africa tends to be quite, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Christians, Muslims will all, you know, still worship ancestors. They'll bring traditional reliefs into the religious practice of the practices that they have, and in general tend to be quite moderate and accepting. And so this radical education did change the, the situation quite uh, drastically. Now then you had the issue also of poor governance and state weakness. So you had a vacuum of power where these groups and you know, even non-jihadist groups could move into, establish control over territory and take advantage of weak states um, and show an alternative to these states in some situations. One issue is demogra demography. You can't ignore it. Um, Africa still has the highest rate of growth uh, anywhere across the world. Niger, which uh, uh, General Morbido referred to, a, a birth rate of 6.9 children per woman to this day. And if you look across the Sahel in particular, you're seeing growth rates of five and six um, children in situations where unlike in years past where infant mortality was quite high, that's been halved and you know, brought down significantly. Long story short, it's any situation where you have a lot of young men with no jobs and no opportunities, you're going to have a problem with um, you know, a very vulnerable population. Um, regional and ethnic grievances, these have gone on for a long time. Oftentimes a very strong state has kind of pushed those down and suppressed them. Um, in a situation where you've got a weak state, a lot of these have been allowed to fester and I think been exacerbated by some of these groups. And then lastly, one issue I'm very familiar with is the ENF security forces. Militaries have had a significant deficit in funding and support since really the end of the Cold War. And I don't think this is raised nearly enough in um, in uh, discussions, but you know, African militaries, especially in the Sahel, are in terrible shape, and they really do not have the capability to fight wars against these insurgent movements. So, I'm going to talk about these four movements uh, that I mentioned before in a minute. Now, they're you know, these are all unique movements, and I don't think there are discussions around this and in the analytic community of how well they're linked up together. Personally, uh, you know, my background is in the U.S. intelligence community. I tend to discount a lot of the linkages that I often see set out in the press. Um, these tend to be homegrown movements. I don't really think that they're necessarily praying or you know, benefiting from one another or from kind of global IS or AQ um, support in, in many situations. I mean, again, that's up for debate. And frankly, the intelligence picture is very weak. But uh, in terms of characteristics, like I said, these past rebel governments, uh, rebel movements, you know, places like Liberia wanted to capture the capital. Many of these movements will make the claims that they do. However, they show no real signs of trying to do so. Um, and again, this is up for interpretation, but ultimately these groups are more or less happy to sit in the countryside and, um, and really get fed off the land rather than actually trying to take over uh, national governments. They tend to be small in size. None of the movements we're gonna to discuss today probably has more than 10,000 fighters in the field at any one time. I mean, that's, that can be a large, in some places, but in general, they're lightly armed. They rely upon stealing arms from militaries in, in contacts. Um, they tend to be quite nimble though, and they know the, the terrain, they can fit in, they can blend in very well. And so they are quite effective. Uh, criminal activity, um, again, the previous presentation talked about the uh, human trafficking networks through the Sahel up to Italy and the rest of Europe. That is a huge moneymaker for many of these groups, especially in the Sahel. And again, this is one that we can debate, but. Honestly, at the end of the day, why I raise this is because oftentimes you will see African governments claim that these are external movements, that this is not something that's coming from uh, you know, Mozambique or Nigeria or somewhere else. In reality, these governments do have to accept, I believe, that these are oftentimes primarily homegrown movements. Uh, they should not be blaming the, you know, somebody from outside for the problems that they're having. Uh, and then you know, the last point too is the jihadist nature. 
when you have, again, a large number of unemployed young men who are getting paid oftentimes $50 a month to join up when they have no other opportunities, um, again, the intelligence picture is weak, but in general, I would be a bit skeptical in thinking that these are true jihadists and every member of these movements are focused on you know, the establishment of a caliphate or the installment uh, the, or installing um, Sharia law, uh, just to uh, throw that out there, because I, I think it's an important thing to note. Just a quick map to show you what I'm going to be talking about today. I think ignore Tunisia, Algeria, Libya, Egypt for now, um, kind of very different dynamics. You know, the four movements, you know, obviously you can see Mali, Burkina, and Niger. This is the, the first one that I'm going to talk about and one that obviously has a lot of currency. Nigeria, which again is the Lake Chad Basin. It's not solely Nigeria. Cameroon, uh, Niger, and uh, Chad are also very much affected. Then you've got Somalia to the far east. Um, Mozambique is the last one that I'll, or third one that I'll talk about because I think this is a new and quite interesting one that um, actually has some, some uh, implications for Japan. One quick thing, you see the small Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, this just kind of characterizes a lot of the things that you know, I think I'll come to. There's a small, Eastern Congo has several rebel groups that have been operating there for decades with lots of different motivations. Really, frankly, they're criminal movements more than anything else, uh, quasi-ethnic movements. But a few years ago, one of those movements decided to start calling itself uh, Islamic State in Central Africa province, uh, ISCAP. And this has created this huge, uh, I don't know, uproar in the kind of analytic community because ISCAP then started taking claim for the attacks in Mozambique a couple of years back. And so it's created a huge debate over whether this is actually an Islamic State sort of uh, proxy war going on in Mozambique driven by people in the Congo. Honestly, personally, I think it's you know absolutely not true at all. Uh, I don't think there's any historical links between the two. There's no proven links between foreign fighters coming from DRC down to Mozambique. There are reports of a handful here and there. But again, it gets back to this issue of responsibility. Um, governments do need to take you know, acceptance or need to start accepting that these are homegrown movements rather than blaming others. Uh, and then again, last night, just that chart in the lower left corner, you can see the trends in terms of casualties related to these movements. Don't trust any figures around casualties, fatalities, um, displacement. I think all of them tend to be off um, and underreported by a significant degree. So, uh, but you can see the trend line and I think that's the important point. So just to jump in, uh, can I, I wanna move through these relatively quickly. Uh, you know, this map shows where the attacks are. You know, the Sahel has taken off in a, a terrible way in the last couple of years. The thing to note here are those arrows. The arrows moving towards Senegal, Côte d'Ivoire, Ghana, Togo, Benin, um, and then Northwest Nigeria too, which has not been affected in the past like the Northeast has. Uh, the trend lines here are extremely worrying. Now, how did this start? I won't go through all the history, but the bottom line is once the fall of Libya in 2011 actually really set this off. Tuareg, who were kind of the desert people of the Sahel, moved back into Niger and Mali. Uh, and also in early 2010, set up a, you know, a sovereign state in Azawad in Northern Mali, uh, more or less took over the Northern half of the entire country within a, a couple of months. With that, a few extremist movements that have been operating in Algeria, uh, GSPC and AQIM, um, outgrowths of those movements started to grow to join up with the, um, uh, the Tuareg. And you know, this, it, it's a long complicated story, but bottom line is those movements started to um, claim ascendancy in the north and across Mali over the last few years. Early on, MINUSMA, the um, UN peacekeeping force, did stabilize the region. The French, with Operation Barkhan, um, also referred to earlier, um, has been on the ground for several years. However, this early stabilization since about 2016 has gone downhill. Um, just a few things about this. I mean, this is the poorest region of the world. Niger is the last ranked country in the Human Development Index. Uh, Chad, Mali, and Burkina Faso are in the bottom eight. So, you know, you just have to keep that in mind that this is the least capable region of the world in stopping this sort of thing. Um, again, almost completely Muslim, but again, a tolerant, historically quite a tolerant place. And, you know, the, since 2013, these actors have intervened, at, I mean, multi-billion dollar cost. Barkhan is almost a billion dollars a year. Um, Minusma is more than a billion dollars a year. And I throw this out too from UN peacekeeping, Japan is the number three contributor to UN peacekeeping in the world. So even if there's not a direct implication all the time, there's a significant indirect implication for Japan around um, anything related to peacekeeping. 
And you know, these insurgents, these are not strong movements, but they have been able to take out, you know, on at least three occasions, almost 100 if not, or more than 100 military, Chad, Mali, and Nigerian, uh, which is a huge number when your military is only number about you know, maybe 20, 30,000 um, soldiers in the field. And what you've seen in the last year, though, is you know, again a significant increase. These are this is from ACLA data. Um, uh, you say database that kind of tracks uh, attacks around the world, and you have seen this increase in fatalities and number of clashes. Why that is increased in the last year is hard to say. You know, some people would look at COVID as part of the part of the issue. Um, however, I think it's also just these groups being very clever about how they manipulate communities. They've turned sides, you know, communities that don't like each other uh, in, in this region. Oftentimes it's pastoral farmers versus pastoralists, you know, the cattle that tread over the farmland. These are conflicts that have gone on for years. And then small subgroups of ethnicities that have had tensions dating back for generations. And these groups have been very clever at um, exacerbating these uh, conflicts between groups. So ultimately, we're at a bit of an impasse here. You know, there's discussions of negotiation with some of these groups. France has consistently said that they're you know, not going to negotiate with terrorists. Uh, however, there's increasing, increasing um, dissatisfaction with France across the region. And so at least a lot of questions what the, Fran uh, the French role is going forward. So again, I could spend a lot more time on this, but just for interest of time, I need to move forward. Now, the other regional conflict, and again, you can see it's not that far from where we were talking about is in Northeast Nigeria around Boko Haram and um, its outgrowth, the Islamic State West Africa province. This has been in effect since 2009. Also similar to before, it's ebbed and flowed, very similar religious and socioeconomic dynamics uh, in terms of the tensions between communities. Uh, but you know, the, I, the hard core of Boko Haram has been quite radical in terms of you know, the no education for women. Boko Haram, uh, you know, Western education is forbidden, which is what this means. The group uses another name now, but generally most attacks up here are, are understood by this group. You did see, um, again, about 2014, 2015, the group peaked. It did have a great deal of success, but uh, a slightly more effective security service response, including mercenaries, which is a interesting dynamic, did erode the group. However, the last couple of years, similar to the Central Sahel, you've seen this uptick in violence. And, um, and also, again, like I said, Northwest Nigeria too, which is a separate situation. But the, um, you know, ISWAP in particular, one thing that they're quite good at around the Lake Chad Basin is in, on the Chadian side is actually protecting civilians. Civilians look at the Nigerian and the Chadian military oftentimes as a uh, predatory force. They steal from them. They, you know, will, you know, violence against civilians is quite common by militaries. And so they look to insurgents to actually protect them and they will pay them taxes. They will uh, pay them to protect the trade routes because the state is not doing that. And so this gets back to that issue around the weak state creating a situation whereby these groups can prosper. So um, yeah, and another quite worrying one. Mozambique is the newest insurgency and probably the most mysterious. Nobody knows who is carrying out these attacks. There is a group called um, ASWJ, al Suno wal Jama, uh, that most people believe is behind them, um, a, a radicalized group that kind of came up in the early 2010s, were um, pushing for you know, kind of a more radical form of Islam in the north. Cabo Delgado, northern Mozambique, is only about 50-50 split, maybe slightly more Islamic than Christian. So this is actually the you know, insurgency that is taking place in the most um, diverse community or diverse region across the continent in terms of uh, religion. But um, you know, this is an area with persistent poverty, tr traditionally underdeveloped by the state. Uh, but then looking offshore, and this is what I'll come to at the end, these gas fields offshore are going to quadruple Mozambique's GDP. And I was just in Mozambique in November, December, and one of the big narratives is that people in the community, um, they think they're gonna be left behind. They're being left behind already. You know, the jobs that are being created in Mozambique, the Praia, Pemba, to you know, develop these gas fields are going to people from Maputo all the way down south. They're almost basically a different country, even though it's the same, same capital. Um, and they resent it. They don't see the opportunities going to them. And this is one of the drivers that many people believe is behind the rise of these movements. So again, coming back to, it's not necessarily a jihadist movement, but um, you know, there's a lot of different factors that come into it. Now, lastly, Somalia. Somalia is 
slightly different than I think some of the other ones. It's definitely the most entrenched and longstanding movement. Um, this group Al Shabaab, you know, comes up really from the early 2000s. Somalia d just d has been decimated as a state since really the early 90s. It has not existed as a as a unitary state since that time. And so, in a similar vein, you know, the communities have looked to Al Shabaab and some of its other groups to as protection in many ways. Um, but definitely the most powerful movement, you can see the armaments here are definitely more impressive than you see for some of the other movements across the continent. The co international community has been involved in Somalia in a big way for two decades and with almost no impact, unfortunately. And um, you know, for a while there was a, a bit of progress, but you know, I'll just come to the map in the next one. You can see, I mean, this is a map showing who controls what. Anything in white, so you see the capital and a few little splotches of white in the south, that's government controlled. And yet, and look how small that is. You know, the government cannot control anything in the rural areas. It will take a town, but it will lose it almost immediately. Um, Shabab, is, some studies recently showed that Shabab is probably earning more from taxation, including inside Bogadishu, than the Somali government. And so um, I think this is, of all the conflicts on the continent, probably the most intractable and um, one that is, you know, very, very difficult to see resolution in the near future. Now, quickly, I just want to talk about Japan's Africa interest, because I think this comes into, uh, you know, really, I want to make this relevant for all of you. Now, if you look at, you know, the Free and Open Indo-Pacific Initiative, obviously, Southern and East Africa are a big part of this. You've seen growth in Japanese firms and banks investing in the region. Ports and infrastructure is a, uh, you know, a huge focus. Uh, aid, about 1.5 billion, has been consistent, even with cuts in international aid in recent years. A very good focus on skills development, which, in, in my opinion, is is laudable. The continent trade is about 20, 20 billion in total. That's actually just behind UAE of all places. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk. I think a bit of disappointment in official circles where. Yeah, I think there's a push to get a lot more African trade, this $30 billion push. Um, and then, you know, former PM Abe even said in 2019 that acknowledged that it that didn't come anywhere near that. And so um, Japanese investment in the continent still is a bit lagging and also very heavily focused on places like South Africa that tend to be quite well developed. Um, East Africa is growing, Kenya to an extent. Um, TCAD tends to be the primary political tool for engagement. But, um, but ultimately, the bottom line is here is Japan is a, 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 a secondary player. I mean, if you look at China, uh, I mean, I think China is actually such a player you know, far beyond even the US. I mean, if you look at US interests in Africa, they've been dwarfed by those in China. Um, I think Japan is you know, a, a bit below kind of the US and EU. But if you look at the UAE, Turkey, um, Qatar to a lesser extent, those are, that's kind of, the, kind of the area where I kind of see Japan on the continent. Uh, and security also has not historically been a major focus, but Japan does have a base in Djibouti that has done quite a bit on piracy. Now, where does, the big question, what does Japan care about these jihadist movements? And frankly, if you look at the Sahel, Somalia, there's not much there. There really isn't. I, they'll circulate a paper that kind of lays out where Japanese companies are. I don't think there's any Japanese investment in Somalia whatsoever, very minimal in the Sahel. Uh, in Nigeria, you know, Japan was importing three and a half billion dollars in oil as of 2014 from Nigeria. That's down to about 180 million. So, you know, Japanese oil interests have, have kind of been negated a little bit in Nigeria. And even there, Boko Haram doesn't threaten oil. Um, however, Mozambique is quite interesting. So, Ravuma One, which is the gas concession, is, you know, Mitsui is a 20% shareholder. Total is the operator. Um, and then, you know, recently, you know, Japanese government announced a 14.4 billion financing deal. To develop this project, so this is a massive, um, I mean, really by Japanese standards, a massive investment on the continent. And now, where is that going to come from? Is that Tokyo Gas is going to be the off taker? So about 25% of all the gas that comes out of Mozambique for the next 20 years is going to be going directly to Japan. So again, you see a key national interest there. Um, however, the development of these gas fields, Total has suspended its operations. It's evacuated 3,000 personnel from the Afungi Peninsula. Uh, to suspend operation. Total is in a situation where it's trying to figure out what it wants to do and how it wants to go forward because it has these offtake agreements signed. It needs this project off the ground in 2024, but right now they can't do any work because of this insurgent threat. And so, you know, one of the things my company does, we actually do military training there and we're seeing that sort of um, uh, the need. You know, the military has shown itself absolutely unable to respond in the field. And so, um, one of the things I would throw out is that 
in the near to medium term, this security assistance is something that Japan uh, probably should consider and give some thought to because this is an area that the Mozambicans uh, need a great deal of assistance and will allow this project to go forward. So, you know, this is my conclusion. I think this is uh, one of the areas where Japan can make a huge impact around capacity building. This is not an area where, you know, France and the US are doing quite a bit in the area of inter intervention, not really in Mozambique. Actually, nobody's really doing much of anything in Mozambique. China has a good, has, has good relations with the Mozambicans, but they tend to shy away from security. They just don't really want to get involved there. Um, so, you know, this is where it's kind of asymmetric warfare in a sense. If Japan wants to think about opportunities and ways that it can get, you know, curry favor with African governments and have a real significant impact, I do think that the capacity building element um, is one that um, can, be, can be quite useful. So um, let me stop there. I have tried to stick to about 20 minutes and a bit over, but uh, a lot of ground to cover. Thank you very much, Dr. John Saiko, for your very comprehensive presentation of, of, of the situation and also your assessment are uh, very helpful uh, for, for Japanese uh, who has stakes in this region. Uh, we have some you know, energy expert in Japan or um, African specialists in Japan. So if they have some, some quick question that I, I want to take it. So is there any you know, question to John Saiko's presentation from the floor? Okay. Um, okay, so uh, we have another presentation. Um, and last but not, not least, uh, um, uh, Professor Mark Lavergne, uh, who, is, uh, who has been stationed in various French um, cultural scientific institutions uh, or over the Middle East and Africa. Um, one of them is a very, very uh, prestigious um, uh, institution called CEDEGE. It's a, a French Egyptian Center for Scientific Research and Cooperation, which is based in Cairo and it's a very respected academic institution. At the same time, it's a very diplomatic. And so many Japanese uh, scholars working on history, working on uh, social uh, history, economy, uh, who, who, are, uh, who have been in touch with, with in the past uh, with, with him. So, but uh, Professor Mark Navarini is uh, now Emeritus Professor at the Department of Arab and the Mediterranean Studies, and also Emeritus Head of Research at the National Center for Scientific Research. He will uh, make his presentation uh, on the, the proliferation of terrorism from the Middle East to Africa. So, um, Professor Laverne, um, please. Can, can, can you, oh, can you uh, make microphone on? Um, oh, 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 there's some, some problem, some issue. Yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, very good. Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, it reminds me of a very uh, um, effective uh, and uh, tense uh, moments that we spent uh, with our Japanese colleagues in Egypt in that time. And um, now I will try to, to confirm or to comment the previous speakers' presentations on, on Libya, on Africa, which were very much uh, informative. So I will start my video. Yes. Yeah. Is the video coming? Yeah. Oh, good. So I, I, I was remembering, thinking of, of this presentation of uh, an experience that I had back um, over uh, 50 years ago, that was in 69 of the last century, in the south of uh, Algeria, close to Niger and to Libya in an oasis called Janet. And there was an attack by uh, nomads coming from Niger, uh, about uh, 500 kilometers uh, away on camel horses. And they were attacking the oasis where I was in, uh, in Janet. And this was um, a kind of um, remembrance of the old times. Uh, one of these last uh, rezu, they call that, attacks against the Tuareg, 
that we are controlling this area. So uh, instability in that part of the world is not really new, but um, uh, they were they were looking for food, and uh, it expressed also the artificiality of the borders in Africa. And this is one of the major problems that uh, the Saharan and Sahelian countries are facing today. That uh, those borders that were were drawn by France um, on colonial times uh, are including people that are parts of them farmers in the south and part of them held us in the north, in the desert. And these people of the north, broadly speaking from Mauritania, uh, no, from Mali, Niger, Chad, were excluded from uh, the capital city's um, uh, power taking and they were not given enough uh, perhaps means to survive or to thrive. They have uh, so national budgets were concentrated in the south, and this is one of the uh, main sources of all these um, insurrections that we are facing today. Um, so the main problems are that these countries are run by southern elites, which were formerly under the power of the nomads of the herders. So there's a complete reversal of power, which uh, leads this uh, to underdevelopment of the North comparatively to the South, which doesn't mean that the South of those countries in the Sahel are very uh, rich, but they are poor uh, in the North and in the South. <clears throat> this is one, of course, um, an aspect of something that is not new on Earth. I mean, it reminds us to the uh, fight between uh, Cain and Abel, the, the sons of uh, Adam and Eva. Uh, between uh, one was uh, the slide, Mark, uh, Mark, one, uh, can you so, show your slides hello mark yeah your slides the slides ah the slides ah, i didn't know it was to me to to activate the slides and i don't see the slides myself yeah do you get the slides sure no it's your screen i i, I don't see them can, can you see Wait. the two can you see the slides no, I don't see the slides myself. Oh. Share the screen, please. Mm -hmm. Do you see them? No. Can you oh. share the screen? Good. Hmm. Side? Do, do you have a slide? Yeah, I, I, I have. I have the slides. Yeah. Oh, you got the okay. slides? For us? Okay. okay yeah, I'm sorry I will. For I will. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Yeah. Do you get the slides now? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Make it full F5. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, uh, I'm perhaps too old for all these uh, technicalities. So this is a slide that shows a kind of um, meeting where I was trying to uh, con convince some elders of a village uh, back in Darfur in 2006 uh, to uh, make peace with their neighbors. And their sons were acting as uh, criminals, as Janjaweed, that were those who were attacking the villages around. Um, now, uh, these countries, as was said before, are stricken by desertification, climate change, by population growth, and the figures have been mentioned uh, before. So there is this ethnic bias, which uh, leads to um, uh, insurrections all over the area. Here you have some examples of uh, locally grown violence. That is to say that um, the, the violence in the Sahel and the Sahara was not imported from the Middle East. It was locally grown and uh, the, it was used by terrorist groups from the Middle East or from uh, North Africa uh, to establish themselves there, to have subsidiaries in these countries and to also take refuge sometimes in those areas like was the case of Mr. Uh, Drugdel that was killed last year <clears throat> by the French uh, army. He had been defeated in Algeria in Kabylia. He had hidden for a long time and then he went back to the 
Sahara, which has always been a refuge for uh, people who were outlaws. <clears throat> so these uh, problems between the Tuareg and the Tubu that I first mentioned, or uh, from Boko Haram, are also the um, product of uh, very ancient um, uh, differences and, uh, and um, discrepancies. So um, Boko Haram, for instance, is the hair or attempts to be the hair of the old sultanates of Sokoto, of Bornu, I was shown before. And it also acts um, in, the, in the environmental um, threat that we can see. I was in Chad uh, recent years, seeing the drying of Lake Chad. I was supporting some uh, NGOs that were trying to help the uh, fishermen and the peasants around Lake Chad. But those people, their kids, they are prone to go to Boko Haram in order to find a living. So Islam in Africa is not a new phenomenon, of course. Uh, Islam has been there for, for centuries. But uh, the old brotherhoods that were um, structuring Islam in that part of the world are now ailing, they are getting, um, they, they don't respond to the demands of the youth. Or despite the fact that they are very influent in Senegal, for instance, or even in Mali. There was a coup last August in Mali by military, but they were supported and the door was opened by an, um, a kind of brotherhood, a traditional brotherhood, who is taking now a new feature, which is very radical. So these people now who took power in Mali, where the biggest insurgency is taking place, they are going, we will see that, to deal with the insurgents in order to find a national solution for the problem, given the fact that France and other countries, uh, external countries, cannot be of any um, real uh, support. There was also a uh, uh, very um, uh, clear impact of the fall of Gaddafi in Libya. Gaddafi was paying for the budget, national budgets of all the Sahelian countries. He was paying the people and he was paying the administration. He was paying, he was giving a chance to uh, all these people to survive. It was not France that was given them this, uh, this possibility. Uh, it was uh, Gaddafi. And the, the killing of Gaddafi is really a disaster for the whole of the Sahel. So you see now in Sahel, Toyota car. So the uh, Japanese uh, industry is uh, un unwillingly supporting the rebels because they have really developed a kind of love of Toyota cars that they use as they call them technicals. They put a machine gun on the, on the rear, another near the driver, and they are able to drive without any tarmac road for hundreds of kilometers a day. And then they, they, they join together and they attack a target, which can be a capital city like Khartoum in the past years or any other, um, other city in, uh, in other countries. So these, um, this, uh, this is a very cheap means somehow uh, to be very efficient and to uh, surprisingly the drones or the planes are not able to uh, fight and to counter these kind of strategies of tactics because the cars are driving uh, isolated. They don't only join at the end when they have to attack a, a target. <clears throat> so you have these uh, uh, maps that have been shown before. And the one on Mali shows the diversity of the support that these um, um, groups are gaining. They are not only aligned with Al Qaeda or with the Islamic State. They are also locally grown. Some of them have uh, local components and local, um, I mean, uh, aims. They are uh, based on uh, different uh, ethnic groups also, and they are not uh, led by anyone from ex from outside. And you see that now there is this triangle. 
uh, three borders, Arab between Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso. This is where the whole violence is now concentrated. Another point that is to mention um, is that uh, these groups are also locally funded because they are thriving on the uh, traffic like heroin in Nigeria or like cocaine all over West Africa. Now we have narco trade like uh, Guinea-Bissau, for instance, that their budget is funded by the narco uh, traffickers from uh, Colombia. And it comes from Colombia to Africa because the road of the Caribbeans is closed by the US. So the drug goes into Europe to be re-exported to America. So Africa is a kind of gateway. And of course, the people who help these uh, groups, the planes or the cars or the trucks that are crossing the desert to North Africa, they are given, they are supported and financed by the um, terrorist groups. And it's also the groups, groups uh, roles of the migrants has, has been shown in previous uh, speakers. Uh, but now there is also in this part of the world, a concentration of insecurity. It's not everywhere. It's mainly the place which we saw before, the three borders, and uh, also Adamawa and Borno in Northern Nigeria. And this doesn't hamper the uh, functioning of a state like Nigeria, which is exporting oil, nor is it um, disturbing the economy of Algeria or Morocco, nor even of some uh, African states who are now exploiting oil, for instance, where these terrorist groups are not involved yet, but they are more and more. We can see the, the threat and the anxiety of the coastal countries in West Africa, because they see that these terrorist groups can now have subsidiaries in the coastal states like Ivory Coast, maybe tomorrow Guinea, maybe Ghana, uh, they, are, uh, they are touching major interests, which is agricultural interests, of course, and also mineral wells. This is the future that I can um, think of for these groups. They are gaining more and more on the instability, increasing instability in this rich, somehow rich countries of the coast, of the West African coast, from Senegal to Nigeria, and maybe to more to Gabon. And on the other side, we see also in, West, in Central Africa. Uh, I was there five years ago in Central Africa, also for humanitarian purpose. And I could see how the country is divided and how there is a, a, some more and more confrontation between Christians and Muslims. Also, those people in Central Africa were not Christian and not Muslims 100 years ago. So now there are new shifts uh, that are created, no rifts, which are somehow artificial and that uh, overlap the uh, tribal uh, divide or ethnic divide in those countries, which is the religious one. Now, the, what about the, the, the trial to stem this crisis by external forces? It's a failure. There is no doubt about it. France is there now for uh, over five years, since uh, 2013. But uh, it's obvious that even the increase of soldiers that are going to be sent, some 600 uh, new soldiers, will not make a difference because France is uh, focusing on trying to cut the heads of these groups, not to solve the root problems that are at the start of these uh, movements. So they are very proud and it's uh, making the headlines in the newspapers when one uh, chief is killed, but he's immediately replaced by other ones. I mean, there's no, um, nothing to, to be uh, ensured about it. So now these um, countries, they are failed states. And this is um, for a large part, the guilt of France because for now 50 years, 
these countries have been independent, but depending on France support, which is somehow aid for development, but without any effect on the ground. And uh, uh, now the, the, the root causes of the conflict, uh, somehow they will be more and more um, considered by other government that this current government in those failed state. And I, I see it as a, a proof uh, with these um, new um, moves in Mali last year. Now in Burkina Faso, where there was a presidential election that uh, uh, both countries are starting to discuss with the rebels. They understand that there is no way out through military intervention. They accept the aid, they, they play the game, but at the same time, and uh, France is uh, quite uh, unhappy about that, they are trying to deal, find a solution which is compromised with the rebels or whatever they are, from Al Qaeda, from uh, Islamic State, doesn't matter. There is a mood for dialogue that is increasing in this particular uh, problem of West Africa. So this is, as I mentioned before, a growing concern for coastal state. There were some attacks, some uh, um, assassinations uh, also of foreigners near Abidjan in Ivory Coast. And this raises a, a big concern because these countries are very important for our economies in Europe or elsewhere. And um, so the, the problem will be more and more um, solved maybe by uh, this kind of discussion that we try to have with rebel groups uh, back in Darfur in the, um, in the early uh, 2000s. And I thank you for that. Thank you very much for, for, for your excellent presentation of, of, of the, the the entire you know continent <laughs> so but uh, um the uh, i'm i'm i so um oh uh, we are uh, we have already used up the time we are uh, allowed but uh, uh, so we we go go on to to you know directly question the answer and so to to previous you know uh, presentation and uh, presentation by John Psycho and also presentation by Mark Laverne. Uh, so anyone who wants to pose a question or make comment would you raise your hand? Okay. Oh so okay is there anyone oh, who would you raise your hand if you yes. question? Mm -hmm. Professor Kuchi, may I ask a question? Uh, yes, yes. Yes, I'm uh, Masa Sugano from uh, representing Jetro and the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry based in Africa, Joburg. I have a question to uh, Mr. Uh, John Saiko, especially uh, regarding uh, France's involvement in uh, security areas in Africa which are non-Francophone speaking. Uh, in other words, I mean, France is deeply embedded uh, security-wise in Sahel regions and other French-speaking countries, but sort of Mozamb Northern, the Cabo de Gazo area, the Mozambican uh, total uh, interest sort of came to it randomly. It's not an area, it's somehow France is in, a, I understand a situation where they have a strong vested economic interest without uh, the historical content or the historical sort of uh, experience in that particular region. And uh, so how do you see uh, France's uh, ex uh, role, uh, France's uh, expertise in uh, dealing with the security situation, uh, the insurgencies and the security situation in the Northern uh, Mozambican region? Uh, that's a very good question, and uh, you know, Mark may have some uh, insights on this as well. What I've seen in Mozambique, I mean, there's a couple of issues. First of all, the Mozambicans tend to be very skeptical of external interference. And so you know, the Portuguese, for example, the colonial bias is still very much there. Um, we're talking to the U.S. Embassy, the embassy cannot get any traction whatsoever with the Mozambicans. And um, when, I was, when I was there, I still I didn't come across the French 
um, being, at least from a government's perspective, being involved in a significant way. I think they're in a wait and see mode. And also, I think they're going to be looking to operate via the EU rather than bilaterally. Um, because also, I mean, as you point out, this is one thing that you see, you know, France does have defense attaches across the continent. Um, they do have small operations. And you know, I was in Uganda last year talking to the defense attache there. They've got a small program doing mountain warfare. But really, Anglophone and Lusophone Africa is not you know, France's backyard. And so um, the issue in, in Mozambique, too, is that I also think that Total privately, and you know, talk to Total, and I think they're looking at solutions around how to, um, whether it's capacity in the military or otherwise protecting their site, that is, um, again, it tends to be more focused on the, from Total itself rather than the government. So the, the long story short is I think it's, it's rather, rather uncertain. I think multilateralism is going to be the way in places like Mozambique through the EU. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the perspective that I saw. No, thank you very much. I'm exactly the person who sort of has to do the planning from the energy side as well as the security side. And uh, your, uh, yeah, your insight on uh, Mo Mozambicans being, becoming, being very hesitant to uh, foreign, especially Western powers uh, involved. Uh, that, I see that too uh, my, from my conversation with the US uh, embassy officials and military attaches. So it also means that we can't rely entirely on uh, you know, France or the US. And it's this role, as you, mentioned, as you rightly mentioned, uh, the relative role of Japan it becomes relatively higher because everyone, no one else has the diplomatic, has the political weight or the security experience in that particular area. Thanks. Okay. And Japanese and Japan is seen as quite neutral too, which I think is quite yeah. important, quite interesting too. No, thank you very much. Certainly. Um, uh, Professor Shinoda, do you have any question comments? Uh, thank you very much, uh, if you allow me. Uh, just uh, briefly, uh, thank you very much for wonderful presentations. I have enjoyed uh, all the presentations. Uh, as regards the final one, uh, uh, by uh, Professor Mark uh, Leben, uh, under the title of Proliferation of Terrorism from the Middle East to Africa. Oh, by the way, I'm, uh, my name is Hideaki Shinoda. I'm working for uh, uh, Tokyo University of Foreign Studies, specializing in international peace operations as regards uh, uh, their responses to armed conflicts. Uh, but nowadays, of course, uh, we include the phenomenon of uh, violent extremists uh, in uh, especially in the African continent, as well as in the Middle East. Um, but, uh, in terms of the proliferation, <clears throat> we, uh, well, let's say uh, 10 years ago, we had a little bit more simplistic understanding that uh, uh, violent extremists, wave of violent extremists uh, came from the Middle East to, to impact uh, some of the elements in the Middle East, ranging from the Horn of Africa and the Sahel. But nowadays, as you have mentioned, we are observing more homegrown uh, violent extremist activities in the African continent. Uh, and then it is spreading, uh, let's say, to uh, new areas like Mozambique and so on. And uh, still, however, they have some kind of networks uh, of uh, elements in the Middle East, if not direct ISIS, uh, Al Qaeda. Uh, networks, so all uh, some other uh, linkages with the elements in the Middle East. This is really an intelligence affair. Uh, I'm just a humble scholar, so I, I haven't got uh, any uh, clandestine information uh, concerning these elements. And then for everyone, uh, it is very difficult to detect uh, any kind of the nature uh, or level of uh, linkage between uh, African violent extremists and then the any other elements in the Middle East or North Africa. Uh, it's, uh, it's becoming loose and uh, ho home ground elements are uh, developing. That is true, but how much so? And in what elements of uh, linkages networks may still uh, remain, it is very difficult to say. So do, if you have any uh, observations as regards this point, like linkage, existing current linkage between the elements in the Middle East and uh, through North Africa and to the Sub-Sahara Africa, Sahel region, Horn of Africa. Uh, I would like to hear about your views. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, I, I don't know if I if I heard perfectly well what, what you uh, what you were worrying about or, or taking up. Um, what I can mention that there are 
uh, strong links between West Africa and uh, the Arabic Peninsula, for instance, or even Iran. Uh, and these uh, links are increasing. There are economic links, of course, but also ideological links. That is, the governments are playing their cards. Um, I notice in Niger, for instance, there is an increasing uh, presence of Iranian, that is Shia, um, militants, which is very new. I mean, people are converting. Uh, they are uh, somehow subject to, um, to, to uh, growing uh, influence of Iran, but also other countries like uh, Qatar, they have investments in food security, for instance, near Lake Chad and other places. And of course, UAE and Saudi Arabia also have invested uh, in uh, agricultural uh, development uh, for, for their own sake, for uh, food security, which has an impact on the population. And uh, also the, the, the dispatching of uh, Qurans, the aid for Ramadan, for, for the Eid. This is all very important. Uh, this is a, a war of influence between uh, various um, Muslim countries from uh, the Gulf, affluent countries from the Gulf. And lately with the COVID-19, uh, there was a sending uh, by, um, by the UAE of massive uh, support in terms of masks and uh, all these uh, things that were needed by the local population uh, over there in uh, in Africa. So you see, um, you can't escape any anywhere in this uh, this time uh, the the competition of influence between various uh, Islamic uh, states and the population is siding with one or the other according to its interest or um, according to to the capacity of uh, these uh, in influential actors uh, to uh, promote their own uh, views. But this is mainly uh, based on interest rather than uh, on um, religious thinking, uh, uh, so to say. And uh, this competition comes to, to cover the old uh, Islamic structure of those countries with the uh, Turuk, with the uh, brotherhoods that were there for ages. So I don't know if I answered your question, but um, in terms of uh, Al-Qaeda or Islamic State presence, I'm, I'm not sure it's so relevant. I mean, uh, the, the matter is, do they gain followers? Do they gain, uh, have they the financial means or have they the, 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 the credibility in order to, uh, to get adepts, to get soldiers, to get the youth? And uh, I'm not sure that, that it's so, um, so important and crucial uh, in the balance of forces now in this area. The use, of course, most of them, because they are deprived of their fields, of their animals, of, of any future, either they migrate to Europe or they join uh, rebel forces. This is uh, somehow basically the choice that they have. I have something to add also on this point, if you don't mind. Yeah, for the linkage. First, I, I was agreeing with you, uh, Professor Shinoda. You may, I mean, before I was preparing something about Africa, but really when I read more, I can conclude maybe three, four points also to add to my colleague, uh, Professor Lavarnay for this kind of linkage. Like number one, uh, Emirates seaport authorities. Okay, so now, I think they have something to do with Senegal in Western Africa and, and also some other seaports in Africa. So this is a very important economic linkage. On the other hand, you know, just I was talking to some, one of my juniors a few days ago who is still in the service right now. And we were talking about the Africa, uh, the center of Sahel and Sahara fighting terrorism, something like that. I will remember its name and I can even send it to Professor Satuchi. This is now, it's located in Cairo, in Egypt. And this center is specifically for training, crisis management and other issues. It's for Sahel and Sub-Sahara to counter terrorism and for crisis, as I told you. And it will have a lot of things. It's also, it's training and operations. Uh, I mean, to, to to observe control or something like that. 
and uh, it's more involved by Europe and United States of America with Egypt, actually. Uh, infiltration of Daesh. Boko Haram is mainly, you know, in Africa, right? And Boko Haram is more aggressive than Daesh according to the statics of operations. But Daesh is more famous. If I talk about one more thing, when you follow NATO newsletters about Sub-Sahara, they consider there is different between Daesh, which is the Middle East, ISIS, Islamic State uh, in Sham and, and Iraq, okay, and Boko Haram in Africa. So NATO still have separation, but actually by some other specialists, it's taken different way. As I mentioned in my lecture, that several terrorist groups flee from the Middle East, and some of them went to Africa. Boko Haram pledged, recognized Daesh. They said, we are loyal to Daesh. And, and Qaeda became enemy for both of them. And if you don't mind, maybe I add something. And this, anyway, this is something like a linkage between both of them, because the Islamic State really, is, you would like to have the true Islamic State in Africa and Middle East. This is the main goal in Africa and Middle East, in front of the bad West, ideologically, here. So this is a big security linkage. And the good anti-ISIS is now Al-Qaeda. And the main problems between both of them, it's very, very ideological. Like for example, Al-Qaeda says about who does not believe in God that he should be killed. ISIS, different. Any Muslim does not believe in ideology of Daesh, even Muslim, Christian, whoever, should be killed. Suicide, suicidal operations. Qaeda believes that suicidal operations can be done just for suicidal operation that I go with the belt of explosion and then explode some place and explode myself. Guy said, this is haram, this is no, shouldn't be done this way. He should go fight. And every one of the Islamic fighters of ISIS, they have the belt with them. After he finishes immunization and is still this, the, uh, our, their enemies, which us like, for example, Egyptian armed forces or whoever, then I finish now my, my, my ammunition as ISIS and they still alive or some of them, then I go and explode myself with them. So this is something like end. So this kind of difference of ideology still remaining and that's why they are fighting themselves and they are fighting more and more and maybe some of our colleagues uh, talked about that. The fourth thing is something competition. It's not announced that much by uh, General Murabitu just mentioned in his map. As you are aware, there is a competition between some specific countries of sending gas through the tubes, through the pipes, I mean, which well known as Israel to Europe or Israel to Turkey. It has been mentioned also Egypt from LNG liquefied gas to send to Europe through Spain and Italy. But there is also another one which is still under other competition between Algeria and Morocco to have the African gas to Europe through Spain and Italy. And France maybe, I'm not very sure, but I'm sure about Spain. So there is also competition and making some kind of another way of linkage between North of Africa, Africa itself, which is the source of the gas and the Middle East. That's it, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for insightful comments. I really, really impressed. Uh, so to say the least, uh, I would say that uh, the influences uh, or linkages are quite uh, multidimensional these days. So. Uh, uh, we need to uh, explore the, these issues uh, more uh, intensively. Thank you very much. Thank you for your questions and uh, 
discussions. So, so uh, is there any other questions um, or any comment or any additional, you know, comments from the, our presenters? Um, is it okay? So, as always, we are uh, overflowing the time schedule. So <laughs> it's almost oh, this is, oh, 30 minutes uh, or after or after the, the plan time limit. So um, yeah, we could continue on and on, but uh, I think now, now is the time for closing. So um, thank you very much for, for four of our uh, presenters and also many you know, questions, discussions from the floor. Uh, thank you very much for participation. Uh, such an exciting topic and uh, such a number of audiences who uh, until, uh, uh, until the very late, you know, um, together with us uh, participated in th this opportunity. So thank you very much. And uh, we, we will see, you know, each other in the coming, you know, next month. And that's the first part of this series. So um, please check out the, the new law, newly launched uh, Rhodes website and the details are uh, on, on there. So um, thank you very much uh, everyone for, for joining us today. I'll see you, see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so very much. much, as always. Thank you. Thank you for participating, overcoming such a technicality, technical issues. You know, uh, now, now we, we can uh, cooperate. You know, you know, communicate with you fr from the luxury of, of our you know study room. So uh, we we want to continue on this uh, kind of uh, uh, effort. So uh, please keep in touch and. Uh, uh, please, you know, come back to our coming, you know, event. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you. Bye. 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 Au revoir. Arrivederci. Grazie. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sugano-san. Uh, Professor Keuchi, just a technical question. How does one download the presentation? Which web? Does it download from Zoom or? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, yes, uh, we have. <laughs> shared our presentation files on chat box, but uh, if we have not yet um, downloaded it, I, I, I can, you know, we can send it to you by email. So oh, yes, please. I have not been able to, maybe because I am doing it through uh, uh, the app, iPad app. It doesn't, oh, uh, the chat, the chat I doesn't come. I yeah. See. In the chat doesn't show any files. Oh, okay, okay. So uh, um, would you just uh, drop a line to, you know, our okay. address and uh, we'll, we'll send it to you in four files. Okay. Presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. Arigatou gozaimasu. Thank you very much. Thank you.